We have done some discussion on plant nutrients, what the plant needs for growth and reproduction. We've done some discussion regarding transport of those nutrients within the plants and how they get them through fertilizers and agriculture and compost and organic farming. But what happens if you're just a plant in the middle of the rainforest? You might be healthy, like our example here. You might have some sort of nutrient deficiency. It might surprise you that while the rainforest is a very biodiverse location, the soils are actually pretty terrible. So what we have to consider is in these extreme environments or environments with variable environmental factors such as heavy rainfall, drought, changes in the amount of sunlight in given periods, all of these things we have to take into consideration so we can understand how plants are surviving so well in these extreme environments, so to speak, without the aid of humans. So first of all, when we talk about nitrogen in plants, we've mentioned before that nitrogen is actually the largest limiting factor in plant growth and success. Nearly every plant on this planet has nitrogen deficiency. Most also have phosphorus, but focusing on nitrogen for just one minute, I think this is often confusing to folks because our atmosphere is full of nitrogen. So why is it that plants are nitrogen deficient? Don't they just take it out of the atmosphere with, with the carbon dioxide that they need, the oxygen that they need to do cell respiration? Why is it that they're so deprived of nitrogen, given this? Well, it turns out that plants cannot directly take nitrogen from the atmosphere. They cannot use N2 gas. So they are very dependent on what we call nitrogen fixing bacteria to help them convert that nitrogen into a form they can use. Plants actually perform, prefer nitrates. So nitrate, as you see over here near our root, is actually NO3. So we have to convert N2 atmospheric nitrogen into NO3 or at least into NH4. Ammonium is another way that plants can take in nitrogen and use it fairly efficiently. We actually apply ammonium as a fertilizer. So this is a decent way, but if they had their choice, nitrates would be a better way for them. So you see I have three different types of bacteria sitting on our our diagram here. The nitrogen fixing bacteria are going to be responsible for converting that atmospheric nitrogen for us into NH3 ammonia and then NH4 ammonium. We also have ammonifying bacteria so they are ones that are actually going to eat organic materials decaying in the soils, convert that nitrogen in those organic materials or release those nitrogen in the organic materials into the ammonia and ammonium eventually with the addition of hydrogen. Decaying and dead organic matter provide, produces quite a bit of ammonia so this isn't a, it isn't a big step um, for us but those ammonifying bacteria speed up the process. Nitrifying bacteria are really a plant root's best friend. So these bacteria are going to take that ammonium and actually convert it into nitrates and make it an even better form for the plant to take in. So what do you use nitrogen for? Okay, So you got to think, where in your system do you see a whole lot of nitrogen? Well, we give you a clue here with amino acids. Every amino acid in your body is based in nitrogen. What do you use amino acids for? What do they make up? What is the macromolecule that is made up of amino acids? Think about it. It's a critical, critical compound, not only for our, for our plants here, but also for you. So these bacteria are great, but there are a number of plants that have gone above and beyond to really make sure they have nitrogen available to them. Mycorrhizae are a big factor in nutrient depleted soils. 
So mycorrhizae are actually a fungus that cover the roots of plants. Before you get too worked up, fungus in this case are not working to decompose the plant. Remember, fungus feed on dead things. They're decomposers. So yes, I know, you can get athlete's foot and it, it works on your feet and you're not dead. Got it. But in this case, what we're looking for are these fungal filaments to actually surround the root, much like our root hairs do, increasing the surface area of the root. But what they're really looking to do is help to collect the nitrogen from the decaying matters in the soil and make them more available to the plant. This is something we call a symbiotic relationship. Symbiosis means both organisms in the relationship are benefiting. So obviously the plant is getting nitrogen, we just said that. What do you think the benefit of the plant is to the fungus? What is the plant giving to the fungus to make this a symbiotic relationship, mutually beneficial? So think about that. What could that fungus possibly be getting from the plant? The other way that plants may go is to actually produce these nodules, and you see these kind of wart-looking things along the roots. Turns out that many plants that produce these um, nodules will actually be found in some nutrient poor scenarios, but they are a, speci a specific type of plant known as a legume. So you may have heard of legumes before. Legumes we often refer to um, with soybeans. Soybeans are a terrific example of a legume that we see in agriculture and has become very popular in recent years with, with the production of soy milk and soy oils and so on. These nodules actually contain bacteria. If you look up here in this top image, you can see a TEM or a transmission electron microscopy image of the bacteria inside the nodules. So what are they doing in there? Well, the nodules are acting as a home for the bacteria. The bacteria are actually converting nitrogen from the soils and the decaying matter and making them very available to the plants because they're connected directly to the roots. Why is this so important? Well, again, this is a is a mutualistic relationship. This is a symbiosis. So think, what is the plant getting from the bacteria? Nitrogen. It's no different than it taking it up from the soils after bacteria has converted it. But this is a much more direct route if the bacteria that are converting the nitrogen are actually living in your roots. But what is the bacteria getting from the plant? Think about it. Another strange one that we see are what we refer to as epiphytes. Now, the most common epiphyte that you would likely know is an orchid. And orchids are big, beautiful flowers. They have huge flower shows dedicated just to the orchid. So why am I saying here that they are an epiphyte, which means essentially that they grow off of another plant? Well, in this case, they actually are just using those other plants to get better access to minerals and water. So these are, orchids are typically found in rainforest type environments. And I'll show you a picture in just a second of one actually living on a tree. But what we want to look at is they have modified themselves so that their roots do not grow in the soil. Orchid roots actually grow on mosses and on the bark of trees not that they're being invasive so much as that they are gaining an advantage of being more closely um, associated with the rain waters and minerals that are available at the tops of the canopy in a rainforest. Okay? So another one, parasitic plants. The most common one that you would know of here is mistletoe. We think about mistletoe at Christmas time as being this wonderful kind of loving symbol around the holidays. Turns out that parasitic plants such as mistletoe actually do not typically do their own photosynthesis. They simply push their roots into the roots of other 
plants and into the vascular system of other plants and just steal the sugars and minerals from the host plant directly. So they're doing nothing on their own to produce their own foods. This is an orchid growing on the trees in the rainforest. Um, these are very similar orchids to what you would see. Now, in this case, um, they actually have, have um, growing them in a type of greenhouse in this situation so they're growing and they've attached them to these little uh, twigs and bamboo to help you see the orchids better but it would be on a similar tree in the rainforest just like this. Now our mistletoe friend you see mistletoe grows into this very very large kind of advanced uh, plant type structure um, under perfect conditions but the problem is that that mistletoe has actually invaded this plant and you see that the tree that it is attached to has actually died so what we're concerned about there with these parasitic plants of course is the health and well-being of the of the host plant and as you can see it's not a very healthy or well-being plant that it's attached to at this point and I think the favorite of all students in our, in our nutrient depleted plants that have to make some sort of change in lifestyle, so to speak, are the carnivorous plants. So these are typically our sundew plants. Many of you may know the Venus flytrap plant. And the idea here is that these plants still photosynthesize. These are plants. They're doing the job of a plant. They're photosynthesizing, making their own sugars. But the problem is nutrients. Sugar is not the problem here. The problem is a lack of nitrogen and typically phosphorus as well. So one of the best sources for these plants for nitrogen in such nitrogen depleted soils like the rainforest is to actually trap insects um, and sometimes small mammals and look at the conversion then of that or the digestion of that organism into the nutrients that the plant actually needs. So you see here flies stuck in our Venus flytrap um, and a larger winged probably ant attached to our sundew plant here. Um, but there are all kinds of varieties of these carnivorous plants and you see here a pitcher plant, also a very common example um, of, a, of a carnivorous plant. Small animals, as I mentioned, will get trapped by the sticky surfaces on the Venus flytrap and it will close shut. Now, many people think about this as kind of the plant selecting for and cho choosing to close its jaws around this organism. Not the case at all. Um, rather, the plant is triggered that something has touched this sticky surface and it actually uses its vascular tissue to close around and surround this organism and then digestive enzymes will be secreted and very very slowly this organism will be digested. The same is true of the sundews. They'll actually wrap around um, vascular tissue contraction here in this case and changes in the vascular tissue structure and it will actually curl up um, where this ant has become stuck to the surface, it will curl up um, over top of the ant and digest it. And then of course, Little Shop of Horrors for those of you who remember Audrey. <laughs>